lecture number five this time about quality and uh, this is one of my favorite topics this lecture will definitely contain the material which will uh, which will go against uh, some of the beliefs which you might have about uh, quality control and software development process in, in programming projects. So I will try to break those beliefs and I will give you some new knowledge which I will expect you to uh, to start using in your life instead of the, the previous knowledge you had before because people, usually programmers, they have so many misconceptions about quality control, about quality assurance, about testing, about bugs, about bug reporting. But let's start first with the questions which I will expect you to answer and then we will uh, see how accurate your answers were. Question number one. ISO 9000, you may not know what it is, but uh, now it's important to understand what it is. It's a standard. It's a quite famous international standard about quality assurance, quality control. So how do you think this standard defines quality? There are four options. Um, think about them. The first one, the ultimate objective of any project. So quality is something which is the objective. Option number two, the quality is the indicator of customer satisfaction. Number three, the amount of defects that the customer experience in the product. And number four, the degree to which a set of characteristics uh, fulfill requirements. So give me the answer. Write it down. In the, in the end of the lecture, we're going to check who was right, who was wrong. Um, question number two, the architect tells you that uh, 15 bugs can be fixed in current release and we will be and they will be shipped uh, to the customer. So the product contains the bugs and they will be shipped. What do you say? Uh, you as a project manager, of course. First option, cancel the release. We don't do that because we don't send bugs to the customer. Option number two, don't release until they're all fixed. So just, just fix them, work on them. Uh, option number three, don't tell the customer, ship it anyway. Some people do that too. And option number four, how much trouble they may cause. So you're asking the architect how much it's going to cost us if we, uh, if we ship the product with the bugs. Give me your answer. Remember, you are the project manager. In, in the entire course, you are the, the guy who's in charge of managing. Question three, you just hired a QA expert. QA, quality assurance expert. QA stands for quality assurance. What task you would give that person? First, help programmers make our application bug free. That's the task. Number two, test our mobile app and make sure it works well. Also a task definition. Number three, find three bugs in our app. And number four, make sure every bug is in JIRA. Every bug is reported in JIRA. So which one do you think is the right task for, for a QA expert? Maybe you are a QA expert. Maybe you will be, or maybe you were, or maybe you are now. So what kind of tasks the project managers they give to you? Uh, maybe this question is also, also correlates with your current experience. Number four, you want to increase quality of product. See the, the underline. So we're talking about quality of product. Which metric you would control first? Git commits per day, customer complaints per day, CI failures per day, or new bugs per day? This question may surprise you, may confuse you, but still give me the answer. So you are interested in the quality of product. So you probably quality of product means that uh, you want your customers to be happier. So the product, the ultimate product, which we gave to the customer, your boss, for example, comes to you and says, we want the high quality of this product to so do something. And you are uh, the project manager. So which metric you would, you would look at first? Which one would be of your primary concern in order to increase quality of product? Question five, you recruit an external team of testers. So how would you pay them, this team of testers? Um, option number one, you pay per hour, $100, let's say. Uh, Answer to a hundred dollars per feature they test. Uh, so each time they test the feature, they report to you that the feature has been tested. So they you pay them a uh, hundred dollars per test case they execute. So there's a 
written test cases where there are instructions what needs to be done so they go through the instructions they they test one two three step by step they finish the the, the, the script they finish the so-called test case so you pay them or you pay them for every bug they find so they find the bug you pay them they didn't find the bug you don't pay them so pick one you pre, you think is more reasonable uh, to to consider uh, question six customer complains that the quality is low that's a very typical situation too many bugs in each new release so you keep releasing the product you're making new releases and every time the bugs the amount of bugs is, is too high so the customer is not happy how can you find out uh, the root cause so what's happening how do you find out i'm not asking what is the root cause i'm asking how can you find out and there i'm giving you four uh, techniques the first one is called five whys second plan do check act then Six Sigma, and then Fishbone Analysis. You may not know what these words mean, but still give me the answer. Maybe some of you know. Maybe some of you can... Uh, uh, your intuition may help you here. Question seven. Uh, the biggest enemy of quality is... And there are four things. So what are the biggest enemies of quality? Uh, enemy. Remember, who is making the trouble to the quality? Who is the enemy? bureaucracy bugs negligence negligence when we don't pay attention to uh we don't care so there's negligence and enthusiasm when we are enthusiastic and we try to do better so which one is the ingredient of the enemy of quality and the last question number eight there are four bugs reported which one you would prioritize as more important than others Pay attention to the important word underlined. The, the answers are, the first one, a flow is missed in the use case. So remember use cases, we discussed them in the scope management lecture. So there are like scenarios of how the user can use our products. And uh, a flow is one of the, you know, one of the, um, like, a, a, like a, I would say, one of the, I don't even know how to explain it. The flow is uh, is a like a direction in in which the in which the um, the usage of our product may go when the customer may, for example, log in or the customer may log out. So there are two flows or two directions of the flow. So one flow is missed in the use case. The the second uh, problem is a class has, has too many methods. I'm talking about some Java class, for example. So um, we know that the class in the in the Java has too many methods. So that's also kind of a bug. People, some people consider it's a bug. Most people, it's a it's a well known well known assumption that if the class has too many methods, it's sort of a bug. It's it's a problem. Uh, number three, a unit test breaks the build. So we're trying to build the entire product, and the one unit test just breaks the build. And the question, and the answer number four, a security loophole discovered uh, in the production server. So we know that on the server. The server may be hacked and the information may be may be stolen uh, and that's a security loophole so we know about that so which of these bugs are of higher highest importance so that's it now let's get back to the to where we started i'm not sure every one of you were actually answering but i hope you were answering and now we will check uh where you are so remember we started our course in the first lecture I told you about the management triangle I told you that there are three things that a project manager has to take under control the project manager has to uh, has to uh, yeah control observe and, and know what's going on with them and know the reality so the reality for a project manager they it consists of three things the scope the time and the budget uh, scope time and budget yeah so this time uh so this time i am telling you that i was i was wrong so i gave you the the primitive uh view of a project management triangle and it's not just my mistake people realized when they were developing project management they realized that it's not so simple so there are not only three things we control more things and one of them is quality so it's not actually management triangle it's a management rectangle so we control scope cost time and quality so the quality is something that also is an ingredient of of the reality so we can do the project spend some amount of money spend some amount of time implement the features but everything will be of a low quality 
and that will be maybe perfectly all right for the customer if the customer wanted a low quality or maybe the customer wanted a super high quality in this case we can do the same the same features the same scope the same in the same time in the same maybe in the same budget but the quality will be different but i believe in this case the budget will be different the time will be different the scope will be different so we need to control to take quality into account as well as these three other components and i'll show you how so let's start with the first question uh, how iso defines the quality the right answer is this one so the quality is a degree a metric a degree to which we satisfy the expectations of of the of the papers of the documents of the requirements which were coming to us in the beginning of the project so in the in the project for example the requirements they say we want your application to uh, to respond to our requests in less than one second and now our application responds in two seconds so here we we deliver the application which is of a lower quality than it was expected. Or maybe the requirements, they say, we expect your application, every new release of your application contain no more than two bugs, which we can detect in production. So no reasonable requirements should say, we expect zero bugs. Keep it in mind. So if the customer says this, you should understand the customer doesn't understand how things work how project management work so we always expect certain amount of bugs we expect certain amount of problems and the amount of these problems must be under control and then the, the, the expected numbers must be written down in the requirements so the document which you sign with the customer must say that we expect five troubles every month and not more but five is okay something like that so if you look at the first answer here number one the ultimate objective of any project it's a complete nonsense so we cannot make the quality the ultimate objective because the quality doesn't mean happy customer doesn't mean beautiful product it means purely a degree of how much we satisfy to certain uh how how much we uh how how close we are to the uh, to the to the exp to the requirements in the in the documentation but it's definitely not the objective so i can make you i can make you a comparison so let's say a surgeon a surgeon making a surge uh, a, a, a surgery with a patient a doctor and the doctor is i don't know fixing a nose the nose doesn't breathe for a patient so the doctor makes the makes the fix with the nose and during the the, the surgery the doctor checks the, the temperature of the patient and checks what's the blood the blood pressure and checks what's the i don't know what is the mm, the level of cholesterol of the person something like that so these are the metrics and the, the doctor expects the temperature of the patient to stay within the certain borders and if the temperature stays within the borders during the entire surgery then we can say that the quality of the surgery was as expected but definitely it was not the goal of the surgery to stay within the borders to keep the temperature within the borders it's just a, it's just a mechanism of controlling of how we move through the surgery the, the objective of the surgery was to fix the nose of course we can fix the nose and lose a lot of blood of the patient and the patient will will have a fever and whatever it also may happen in this case we may say that the surgery had a low quality because because the metrics were not according to the expectations but definitely saying that the quality is the objective it's just not understanding what is the quality the quality is the mecha is the, is the measurement is the degree to which we satisfy certain expectations second the indicator of customer satisfaction it's better because we can say that yes to some extent this is the this is the indicator of satisfaction but not necessarily maybe the customer didn't care about the quality maybe the customer didn't even say anything about the quality the customer said just just spend this amount of money this amount of time and just make me the product so that it works and i have no expectations specific expectations about the quality so you can have many bugs it's okay just make me something so i can see how it works approximately it, it happens when you prototype software it will happen in your real life when you when you start developing the software and you 
you this product is not expected to be delivered to real customers. You're just making it to prototype things, to to experiment and to prove to uh, to the sponsor, to the investor that yes, this prototype, this um, this concept may work. Then in this case, you don't care about the quality at all. Nobody cares. The quality of code, the quality of the, how many bugs, how fast is the software. All of these metrics are none of the concern because this is the specific kind of a project. So quality is not always the indicator of customer satisfaction. So that's why the standard is not saying anything about that. There's not, not something, it, it is not relevant to satisfaction. Maybe the customer will not be satisfied, but the quality will be very high. So we will keep all the, let's say that the, the, let's get back, back to the doctor example. The doctor made the surgery. The client is extremely unhappy because the nose is still broken, but the, the, the temperature was within the within the expected uh, limits and the, the patient didn't lose the blood and the patient didn't lose any other metrics there were they were completely consistent and uh, completely in line with the with the regulations but the customer nose is still broken and then number three, the amount of defects that the customer experiences in the product. This is the closest one. So we can say it's maybe the quality because this is the amount. It's not, it should be the degree. So you cannot measure the quality in the amount. This is the mistake. So you never say the quality in the amount. You measure quality in percentage. Always. Quality is always the percentage. So it should be 99% quality or it should be 0.75 quality. But quality cannot be 123. That's a mistake. It never happens. So quality is always the degree. Degree means you compare something which is full to something which you able to complete it up to the full. So either you achieve the quality to full extent or you still uh, trying to. And, and I think that even if you have, uh, let's say you have 100 requirements and you able to deliver I don't know, 150 requirements, then still in this case, the quality will be 100%. So we don't talk about the quality over 100. It's just, it just doesn't exist. So the amount of defects is wrong, but amount of defects contribute to the quality. So by looking at how many defects we have, we can say, okay, this is one of the metrics. It's like a, the, the amount of cholesterol in the blood, how many defects we deliver to, uh, to the customer, this amount of defects. Okay. Now we can judge more or less that by the quality, but defects is not the only element of the quality. The quality is not about measuring defects only. It's about measuring many other components. Like for example, the level of cholesterol is the defect. It's not a defect. It's just an indicator. It's just a metric which we observe, which we look at, which we, which we control. So if we control the level of cholesterol, we can say that this is our, you know, this is our quality contributing metric. The, the amount of defects, it's a metric that contributes to the quality. Let me read one of your questions and we continue to the next question. Um, does quality bothers the project manager? Uh, it seems that the quality has nothing to do with the work of a project manager. That's a huge mistake. So you may think that the quality is about, uh, uh, hold on, let me, let me reread your question. The quality is about the scope. If there is a lot of requirements, then the quality will be higher. But if there is low scope, so the quality is low, probably. Uh, quality is not only about uh, the scope. The quality is about, it may be also about the cost. Uh, we, for example, we may say that uh, we want to run the project and we want to not uh, pay more than $100 to, I don't know, per hour for any particular programmer. That's also a quality. That's also how we run the project. And this is their quality requirement. Or we can say, and that's related to the cost management, right? Or we can say we, we run the project, but we have, an ex, we have a quality factor, quality metric that no programmer will be unhappy and no programmer will quit the project. So this is the quality metric for us. So we, we, we work with everything, with the scope, time, cost, everything, but we want to control that we don't lose people during the project. So all of our people during the full year of the project development, they will stay in the team. And that's a quality metric. So the project manager now is concerned about that. And maybe this quality metric is even higher. The importance of this metric is even higher 
than all other metrics. So maybe the customer, and it happens sometimes in, in software companies, especially these days, when the manager may come to you and say, I don't really care much about how big is the product in the end of the year or how beautiful is the, the product or how many requirements you implement. But I do care you don't lose these 25 people who you have in the team because they are all valuable talents to us and they, and they stay with us. That's your quality metric. And, and, and very often managers, your bosses, they will not even say that out loud, but they will mean it. And it happens in large companies because now the, the biggest fight on the market is the fight for the talents. So in this case, they, they want you to, uh, to be more concerned about not losing the talent rather than concerning about the functionality they create. Especially this may be very re relevant for research R&D teams or research and development. When people are thinking, being creative, they're not delivering anything specifically, but we expect them in a few years to deliver something breakthrough. So we need to keep them in the team. If you, if you really start focusing their work on the scope and on the time and the budget, then you can lose the most talented uh, people because they are not, they're not going to be within your expectations. They will write no code, for example, but they will write some interesting research papers. And these people will not fit into the project expectations. So quality, like, like Arsene is saying, quality is definitely a broad definition. Quality covers all areas of project management. Quality controls every, every aspect of project management, as long as we have metrics there, as long as we have metrics which we can control. Next question. Now you understand quality a little bit better. So now let's, let's consider this situation. So the architect tells you that, um, you, that, tells you that 15 bugs uh, can be fixed in the current release and they will be shipped to the customer. What do you say? The right answer is this one. So you are asking how much trouble it can cause. So what is going to be uh, the effect? So, so we expect by saying this, we expect that if the architect is coming to me and saying this, it seems that the situation is not regular. It's, it's, it's abnormal situation. It seems that 15 is probably a, a higher number than the quality expected. So we expect the quality to be probably zero. So we expect that we ship with the zero bugs, even though it's a really false expectation. So only a, a improperly managed team would have such an expectation. A properly managed team would say we release when three or less bugs or five or less, but never zero because zero is very hard to achieve and it's, it's unreasonable to have that expectation. But let's assume this team is managed by uh, not so professional managers as you are. And they, uh, and the architect says, I have 15 bugs. So what do we say? In this case, we, uh, in this case happens, the situation could be called, um, uh, we, <laughs> the, why the, the final answer is right? Because here I want to demonstrate you that uh, every uh, attempt to make something of higher quality has a cost. And when you cannot make it's of an expected quality. There's also a cost associated with that. So in this case, we may say how much trouble, or in this case, I would say how much cost, how much money it will cost us if we do it this way. So what is the cost of quality? How much we get, how much trouble we get if we ship it this way, or there could be another cost associated with this. So this is the cost of the trouble plus there's another cost, how much we need to invest more into fixing them. So evaluating this situation and analyzing the costs associated with quality is the right approach. So quality always costs something. That's my point. Always, if you want, if you want any quality, high quality, low quality, if you want any metrics to, to get them under control, and I'm not saying, and, and, and keep in mind that the high quality means that you, high quality means that you are able to keep your metrics under control. And low quality, it means that you cannot keep your metrics under control. So in case of cholesterol, if the level of cholesterol goes up and up, then it means low quality of the surgery. 
it doesn't mean that the the, the cholesterol goes down down very much it's a it's a it, 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 sorry if the level goes down down it means the quality is still low and if it goes up too much the still quality is low it's not about the ab, the um, the absolute values of the metrics it's about how much you can control them how strictly you control your metrics how well they are under your supervision so in this case you ask how much to how much should it cost and um, uh, here let's discuss these three other options uh, definitely option number one cancel the release um, that would be that would be probably maybe a good answer but it seems to be that in this case the cost of some other costs will be involved which we also need to take into account. So maybe the, the customer will be so unhappy because of the delay. So just answering cancel the release because you only want to achieve the, the, the zero bugs quality, then it's, it sounds to me sounds unreasonable as a practical project manager. So it's always better to find the balance and see uh, whether it's uh, acceptable to release with the problems, is it, whether it's acceptable to allow the fear of a, of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a patient, whether it's okay to have the, the temperature of the, you know, of the temperature of the body of the patient to go up or to ruin the entire operation. So we don't want to lose the, the patient. We, we're okay sometimes with higher uh, temperature. We're okay sometimes with lower blood pressure. It's acceptable maybe sometimes because we know that what are the costs associated with returning the patient to the normal situation or accepting this and continuing the surgery. So you always need to value this. And this is a very uh, popular term, which is called cost of quality. We, 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 we try to evaluate that all the time. So this cancel the release, it's kind of immature. So only quite immature project manager would say that, no, we, we fight for the quality. It sounds pretty immature. Option number two, don't release until they're all fixed. Well, that's, a little bit better because you are you you kind of declare here how much you are ready to pay for this quality i'm ready to pay the time which which need to be invested before they fixed and don't tell the customer ship it anyway that's that's acceptable you know i would ex actually go for this one in most cases because in most cases the the real cost the real cost of the bugs which we ship to the customers it may be quite small and a quick analysis of this may give you this answer quite often. It doesn't mean you're lying to a customer. It doesn't mean you're cheating with the customer. Because most probably you never promised to the customer that you will check internally that there are no bugs and then release. That would be quite rare situation. I haven't met any, any situation like this in, in the real life where the customer or the boss, the, the founder of a company or the people who are on top of you, they really control your internal process and they demand you to release only when you internally see no bugs. So remember, these bugs are found only by the architect. So only the architect knows about them and the team. But the customer doesn't know about that. So in order to reveal those bugs in production, the customer will have to do certain things and to, you know, to, to meet those bugs and to report them. So, you know, I'll tell you a quick story. I worked in, um, in, in a company about 10 years ago and there was a quite large European company. They were doing a lot of um, e-commerce. So they were accepting a lot of money from customers through the credit cards and they were delivering the service. And they had a huge legacy code base, which was hard to maintain. And they didn't have any unit tests. So they didn't write any unit tests. They didn't do any testing internally even. And that was their policy. So not because they were, they were stupid. They didn't know how to do unit testing. They knew about that. They had very high, highly qualified engineers. I, I didn't work for them. I, I knew the people who worked in their team. And these people told me that um, that, uh, that was the policy, how the policy worked. They just said, we release without testing, without detailed testing. We don't write unit tests. We don't spend money on that because we know how expensive it will be in this legacy code base to actually write automated tests. It will cost us millions of dollars. Instead, we just allocate a few million dollars every year to the compensations to the clients when they see the problem. So for example, one customer gives us the credit card and we charge the credit card two times. Okay, what's the loss in this case? The customer will lose, instead of 
the customer will pay instead of $100, the customer will pay $200. Okay, we make a call to the customer and say, we're sorry, here's $200 back to you. That's our mistake. Then we fix the bug in our code. This is the loss. So the cost of quality is $100, but how much will it take for us to cover this very old and very unprofessionally written functionality with a unit test? Much more than this $100. So that was their definition of the cost of quality. They just agreed that we are ready to compensate the bugs. We're ready to pay back to our customers when we fail. And that's okay. That's cheaper than fixing the bugs. So this is the reasonable, um, reasonable attitude, reasonable um, business attitude to, to, to managing the quality. Not just saying our product must be high quality, do whatever it takes to do it. That's not how professional managers should act. Another question, um, uh, I'm reading the question. I think as an ultimate explanation to these questions, you can just say the number of bugs is unlimited, so you can fix them anyway before any release. Does it matter anyhow? Good answer. Well, you're right about the, um, the bugs. You're right that there uh, there is an, an, an unlimited number of bugs in the code. We'll, we will touch this subject right now. So let's go to the next question. We will get back to this the one you mentioned question three you just hired the qa expert what you would give him as of now after the discussion after the the last half an hour of the discussion you now understand that qa is not a tester so qa expert is not the person who tests the software is not the one who runs the unit tests it's not the one who checks whether the product works or not the q it's not the one who is who is measuring the temperature of the patient. The tester in the software development is the, is, the, is the nurse who is checking what is the temperature of the person or what is the blood pressure. But the QA expert is the person who collects this information from the nurse, from another nurse, from another nurse, or in our case in software development, from testers, from people, from HR, for example, like we discussed, so if we don't want to lose the people, so we collect the metrics from HR department, we collect the metrics from programmers, we say how many lines of code you write every day, how many commits you make every day, how many unit tests you create every day, and then you go to testers, then you go to production, and you say, you maybe ask the customer how many bugs you report to us every day, then you go to customer support, and you ask how many calls do you receive from the angry customers every day so you put all these numbers together and now you are the qa expert you put all the metrics together and now you make decisions why the quality is as not expected the overall why the customers are not happy maybe because this metric is affecting other 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 metrics if you are the doctor you're just looking at the temperature you're looking at the blood pressure you're looking at what's going on with the with the nose and then you put all this information together and you decide oh now it's time uh to put this uh to put this uh medicine the extra medicine into the patient so this decision is made by the qa expert the qa expert is not a tester this is a huge uh huge confusion on the market that uh, when they say uh, QA, when they hire you, if you go to the job board, you can find a lot of uh, vacation uh, vacancies where they say we're looking for QA expert, QA engineers. They just don't know what they're talking about. So they are looking for testers, but they are trying to give it a better title. So instead of calling you a tester, because many people consider testers as like second class citizens, so people who are getting lower salaries and people who are less qualified, which is a definitely a mistake so they call these guys qa experts but they are not so if you test the software you're not a qa expert you're the tester you are the one who is measuring the the specific factor one specific indicator of what's going on in one territory of software development software development has many territories has many uh, knowledge domains they're testing they're coding they're writing documentations deploying uh, human resource management talking to people hiring firing all that stuff making user interfaces uh making automated tests maybe not just writing code but making automated tests defining the architecture defining the design many many aspects and in each of these uh, each of these process areas each of these activities we have quality to control we have metrics to control so what is the right task i believe that this is the right answer so if you are the qa expert 
then uh, definitely this is not the answer. Find three bugs in our app. This is the task for the tester. Find bugs. That's a good definition of the task for a tester. This one, test our mobile app and make sure it works well. This may go to tester, but the definition of the task is completely wrong. M test our mobile app and make sure it works well. We're going to discuss it now in a second because this is a very typical mistake for the testers. But let's finish with the QA. So look at this task. Make sure every bug is in the JIRA. So this is a metric control. So I'm saying here, what is the metric here? How many bugs are properly registered in JIRA? Let's say 95% of bugs, we as disciplined uh, customer support service, for example, or programmers, we go to JIRA and report it there. So we protocol everything. So this is 95%. 5% is lost. So that means that we just discuss the bugs and immediately fix them. So let's say the customer calls me, I'm sitting here, the, the customer service comes to me and says, you're the developer, can you fix it? They cannot enter their credit card, they cannot make the payment. I go to the code, fix the code, deploy the new version, it's done. Was it registered in Jira? It was not. So that's bad for quality. So this is the indicator of the quality. And I am as a QA expert, I will go to Jira. I will check what's going on there and I will get back to the to the manager and say, you know, our quality in case of Jira is 95 or maybe it's 50 or maybe it's 15, like in many teams. Then, OK, we have something to fix. Maybe we needed to make a meeting to discuss with everybody, ask them to improve and so on and so forth. So that's that's the right answer. So now let's get back to this very interesting uh, answer, which touches the uh, the area of testing. So even though we, we, are, we agree now that QA is not about testing, but still I want to talk to you about testing a little bit, about philosophy of testing. So a very, another huge misconception, this is misconception number one, there's another huge misconception in the territory of testing is that people believe that testers uh, make sure the, the program, the, the applications work. So like it's, it's the job of a tester to confirm that the product works well and then we can release it so we code we code then we package the product we give it to the group of testers and we ask them is it okay to release it and the, the testers come back to us and say yes we tested everything it's okay to release or no we tested everything it's not okay we continue testing but we found some problems that's a completely wrong understanding of, of testing the job of a tester now i'm giving you the right understanding of testing the job of a testing is to confirm that the application doesn't work. The job of a tester is to tell you that, no, I don't like your application. The job of a tester is make sure that it, not it works well, but it doesn't work. Doesn't work. So the tester, that's why you hire the tester. Because to make sure that to confirm that it works, anybody can do it. Any programmer can say, yeah, yeah, it works. But the job of a tester is to prove the opposite. That's why you hire these people. You ask them, try my application, try to break it. Try to confirm that there are problems, that there are bugs. And if you can do it, I pay you. If you can confirm that there are bugs, then you're a valuable asset for my project. Then you're a valuable resource. We want to continue working with you. But if only you, the only thing you can do is confirm that, yes, it's good. Yes, I like it. Then it's, we can do it without you. And it's, and, it's counter, and, it's, and it's completely counterproductive for the testers. When I'm the tester, I take the product and I, uh, uh, to, to, to confirm that it works, I don't need to do any testing. I can just say, yes, it works, not even touching the product. I can say, yes, it works. You wanted me to confirm, I confirm. So now it's only the question of my, my, my um, I don't know, my personal uh, attitude to, to my responsibility, which is hardly, we can hardly, hardly rely on that. But we can properly rely on the proof which the testers deliver to us. If they can't prove to me, as I'm a programmer, can't prove it, show me the case, show me the... Uh, the scenario, show me the input data, which will break my program, then I will say, wow, that's great. Thank you for this. Now I know what to do. Now I know what I should work with in order to fix that. So saying that 
the job of a tester is to test blah 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 and then make sure it works it's a terrible terrible mistake of of, of uh, project managers so remember that many people will tell you this the testers are here in order to prove that our software works great wrong testers are here to generate bugs this is the job of a tester this is what the output is bugs bug report bug report bug reports this is the output of the testing team not the reports which confirm that everything is great but bug reports if they stop generating bug reports fire them it's done you don't need them anymore so they need to generate more and more more complex more sophisticated more deeper testing the the, the, the more complex the product the more stable is the product the more difficult it is for them to generate new bug reports of course because you fix those bugs and there are not so many new of them they're they're still there like Arsene is saying there are unlimited number of bugs there but it will be harder and harder to find them if the product is getting stable 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 so finding a bug now in the Linux kernel and finding the bug in Linux kernel 20 years ago it's a completely two different tasks it takes different amount of time so it was easy to do it 20 years ago now it's extremely hard the same with the with the all other products but extremely hard so pay them more hire better testers increase the amount of testers but still demand them to find bugs don't demand them to confirm that everything works fine demand bugs that's the only output and measure the number of bugs they find and classify them by the importance and uh, the urgency we'll discuss it a bit later and uh, uh, question number one help programmers make our app bug free well, that's also close to number two, but it's better because it's more or less correct. So you help programmers. It's definitely not a definition of the task. So it's completely wrong to tell this to a person. Help somebody to... We discussed that. It's, there is no definition of done. Please go and help this guy. Yes, I helped them. And that's it. How do you verify that? How do I know where to, where to stop? So we never give tasks like this, like this. We never give tasks to people in such a in such a vague and such an unclear form. We always tell people what is the outcome of the task and what's the, the criteria for the exit. When do you stop doing this task? And here we don't have the criteria. Help programmers make our app bug free. It means do nothing and get the salary. This is what it means in reality. So we're going to pay you. You do nothing. We're going to call you QA expert. Be happy. It happens in many companies, but that's not what I'm uh, I'm here for in this course. So we don't do that. But in general, make app bug free. Well, we're never gonna make it bug free. That's a that's a wrong definition. We can never have a software bug free. We can only have uh, a software. We can only have our bug tracker bug report free. That's possible. We can make sure that our bug tracking tracking system doesn't contain fresh or delayed or or, or, uh, uh, or you know, too, uh, too old bug reports. That's a proper definition of, of quality. But saying that our application is bug free, that's wrong. So we must assume, we must agree that any software has unlimited number of bugs. The only question is how fast and how difficult you can find them there. But it's never bug free. Next question, guys. Question four, you want to increase quality of product, which metric you would control first? Now you know what is quality control already, right? So you know that quality control is about going around, putting all the metrics together, all the different metrics from all the different territories of, of the office, of the, of the process, and then thinking, thinking which one you control first, which one you, you affect, which one you demand, for example, to increase so that the patient gets better. So do we need to care about the temperature or do we need to care about the level of cholesterol or we need to care about the blood which is going out of the nose? So which particular metric we care first? And that's the decision you need to make. So the answer here is probably, probably, uh, I would say, uh, would say this one, option number four. So all of them are interesting. All of them somehow may contribute to the overall quality of product for example git commits per day so let's say we just look at this metric and we see that it goes up so we commit 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 so we increase the commit per day like we commit more code every day 
What does it tell us? And at the same time, the quality of code goes down. So what does it tell us? It tells us something. So maybe we need to ask programmers, please slow down. Please keep your speed of development a little bit slower because the quality of code somehow may be related. That may be a good answer if you, if you look at the situation from this perspective. Here, customer complaints per day. This one, I don't think you can control this one. I don't think you can do with that anything. So, well, you can shut, shut up the phone. You can turn off the phone and customers will stop calling you. This may be an option if you really want to, you know, to fool your boss and say, yeah, we have no customer complaints. So in this case, you will definitely increase the quality of product. Observable quality of code, vi visible quality of code will go up because no complaints. They can just simply cannot call you. But in this case, you will affect some other metric. Maybe you will aff affect the amount of sales, the amount of revenue. So they will just stop buying the product. And that will be a, a bigger problem. But it is a solution, definitely. You can, you can do it, but we definitely don't want to go that way. Number three, CI failures per day. That's an interesting metric. So if you look at these failures, if they just increase, and the, the quality of code, the quality of product goes down. So the customers complain more and more, and the amount of failures on the on the continuous integration server goes up. Maybe it's an indicator for you that get guy, hey guys, the programmers, you stop coding so intensively, you better stop start thinking about how to stabilize the build in the continuous integration server because maybe there is a correlation. But most probably, I would say this one, and in this case, I would say not even new bugs. But I mean bugs found internally. This is the bugs I'm talking about here. So when we see that the quality of code, the quality of product goes down in the customer hands, it means that the amount of bugs we find internally is not big enough. So let's assume that programmers produce certain amount of bugs every day. This is the metric which many people studied for for decades and they found out that this metric is more or less stable so if you look at the, the the group of code the coders the group of programmers who write code every day you will see that each of them produce certain amount of bugs it's a constant it's a, it's a more or less constant number which they keep through their life so one guy will produce one bug per, per day another one two bugs per day another three they don't know about these bugs they just produce them they just put them in the code. So they write code with the bugs. They write 100 lines and two lines, they contain the bugs. Another 100 lines, two lines with the bugs. You do it, I do it, everybody does it. Now the question is how to make sure these bugs don't get into the production server. So how can we do it? We cannot catch them when the programmers write the code. It's impossible. They just, they just the way they are, the programmers, write that code for the last 70 years the same way we cannot fix them what can we do we the only way is to ask testers to find those bugs and the more testers can find the less of these bugs will go to production so if you look at the bugs found internally and you see that the bugs that the that the that the client find goes up then we need to increase this number there is you know a formula for the quality uh for the quality of product this one which says that uh it is the number of uh, the number of bugs which are found by us uh no which are found by the uh which uh this is the total amount of bugs total and this is the bugs found by uh customers So, uh, am I right here? So this is the number which probably is, uh, it's, you know, unlimited. So there are unlimited number of bugs, but we don't know how many, but many. And, uh, and, uh, this is also a big number. So if we find, uh, it's the other, the other, the other way around. So the quality should be zero percent if all of the bugs okay i'm i'm wrong here i don't remember the formula let me just give you the idea so the idea is that uh the more bugs we find the less bugs they will find and there is a total number of bugs which we don't know 
yeah you're you're right so this is the uh, you're just helping me with the formula so it's q equals to f divided by f plus u that's right so f is probably the uh, the number of bugs which we fixed which we fixed internally we found and fixed and u is the number of uh, uh, found by the users so let's say Arsene, thank you very much. So let's say we created the product, we delivered, uh, we, we, we don't know uh, how many bugs are there. There are probably 1000 bugs in the product, but then we ship it to the user before, and then before shipping to the user, we found 10 bugs. And then we ship it to the user, we found and fixed. So we found and fixed 10, 10, and they found another 15. So the total quality will be, as you can see, it will be, um, 10 divided by 25. So in order to increase the quality, how can we do it? We cannot anyhow change this number because it number this number goes to an infinity. They're, they can the longer they use the product, the more they will find. It's unstoppable process. There is no no upper limit of this number. So the only thing we can the only number we can change in this formula is this one. So we can change the number of bugs we find internally. So the more we find, the less, not the less they, they will find, not even this correlation. We cannot even say that. We cannot say that if I find 10 bugs, then they will find not 15, but 10. No, because the total is not 25. So 25 is not the total number of the bugs there in the product. The total number is 1000, remember? So if I find 10, it doesn't mean they will not be able to find 15. They will be able to find 50 or 500. They will, but still, by finding bugs, by increasing this number, I have a chance. I have a chance. This is my the best attempt to increase the quality. So new bugs found internally. This is the best metric to control when the people complain about the quality of product. When you hear they complain, just sit down with your team and tell and tell your team start finding bugs or maybe slow down the development. It's also may help. All of these things may help, but the best way is start finding more bugs. Talk to the testers. Okay, question number five. You recruit an internal, external, sorry, team of testers. How would you pay them? Four options. I think now you understand which one is better. Uh, definitely, as long as we already agreed about everything I just told you, then definitely this option is obviously the best. So you find me the bug, I pay you. Because this is the direct contribution to the quality. The more bugs you find, like we just discussed, the less bugs will be found by my customers. That's it. Paying by the hour, complete nonsense. Paying testers by the hour, they will test nothing. They will find you nothing. They will just sitting there pretending to be testing, pretending to be finding bugs. And the more difficult is your project, the, the product, the more sophisticated is your software the more difficult it will be for them to find bugs and they will find less and less and you will continue paying them more and more for the time they spend so that's completely unreasonable option number two 100 per feature that they test this is how some companies do it and this is how this is how some test companies will offer you the service so they will tell you we are the test company the test the, the testing company so uh, give us the features for each feature we're going to charge you this amount of money uh, don't buy that. I think it's wrong because in this case, what does it mean you test? Again, I tested your feature. How many bugs you, I, did you find? And, well, I didn't find nothing or I, didn't, I find a few of them, but why does it matter? This is how they will talk to you. You will tell them, how, how can I control you? I give you five features. You're going to test them. And then what's the output? They say, how do we know the output? It depends on your software, blah, blah, blah. We're going to test it. We guarantee that we're going to test it. We will, we promise you we're going to test your features. Don't buy that. You can understand now that they will probably, their testers will have no motivation for breaking your software. They will have no motivation to causing trouble to the software, but they should. This is how testers should, should work. This is the mentality of a tester. The proper mentality of a tester, I want to break it. I want to prove that this is broken software. I want to prove that this feature doesn't work. But where in this definition, what's the monetary, what's the financial motivation uh, aligned with what I just said? It is not. 
and option number three 100 per test case they execute this is a little bit better than the previous option so this is better but still you execute the, the the test case you only do regression test so you only go through the features which are already described in the test already we know about them it is valuable sometimes do regression testing when you have many features you just ask people to go through all of them using the same scenarios over and over, over and over again and testing the same and the same it may be reasonable sometimes especially when you make a new release so you make a new release then you don't want to go to the tester and say hey i'm gonna pay you 100 dollars if you find a new bug in this new release in this case they may miss some obvious thing because they tested them before they tested them two weeks ago and then you come to them again and say only find me only new things because you you're paying for the bugs so they will assume that you didn't break what they tested before you what they found before so they reported to you one month ago that something was broken then you fixed that they confirmed that you fixed and then you make a new release they their intuition will, will tell them that don't test that again try to test something else so in this case, we hire regression testing team. The team or the robot, usually it should be the robot, which just goes through and test, make the same steps, the same test procedures, which we did before. So that's called regression testing. And that should cost way less. So you should separate regression testing from new testing. So for the new testing, you pay them for the bugs. For regression testing, you may pay them for, for the test case they execute. In this case, it's more or less okay. But of course, the best way to pay is this one. There's a question coming. What if developers and testers will, will deal to fool you? Developers intentionally will produce bugs and testers will detect them. The testers income will be shared. Well, it's a typical question. Uh, many people ask that when um, when this idea is being uh, is being promoted, like paying for the bugs they find. Well, usually it doesn't happen, so that's a, also obvious answer. So it's it's hard, it's kind of hard to see that kind of a kind of a cheating that happens between two teams. It may happen between two people, but still, even between two people, it's hard. But it, it's hard to imagine between two large teams, like ten testers and ten developers, they all sit together and say, "How about we?" Uh, we try to steal money from the company, so we cheat on that. It, it, I haven't seen it ever, but but you can um, you can uh, control that. You can prevent that from happening. How? By code review. So if your code review process is strict enough, so if you accept the code from the from the developers by doing uh, the code review, maybe by another team of developers. So you introduce like cross review from, from two teams, for example. In this case, there will be no motivation. There will be no possibility for one team to, to put the broken code, intentionally broken code into the code base. But even if it happens, imagine that it happens that yes, programmers introduce bugs intentionally sometimes. Of course, they're not going to commit the completely broken code. So they sometimes will introduce intentionally broken code. And testers will find those those defects and they will earn some money from that. There is, I don't see a big problem with that because the whole process will work smoothly. It even will help sometimes developers and testers to integrate, to, 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 uh, to cooperate better, to see that how they affect each other. So this, this whole mechanism will be a little bit uh, overpriced. A little bit over budget so you're going to spend a little bit more or maybe a lot no i don't think it's a lot more a little bit more on these extra bugs which were intentionally introduced that but overall the quality of code will still improve because you introduce the bug they report the bug you fix the bug you introduce new unit tests which will guarantee that this bug will not appear again so you remember every time we fix the bug we cover it with the unit test so if you intentionally introduce the bug it was possible to introduce this bug so there were no unit tests in the code and the bug got into the code then it got to the testing staging staging platform then we found it there then it was reported and we fixed that and we covered it with the unit test the benefit is obvious for the for the entire product yeah we overpaid a little bit but that's not a problem in this case Next question, customer complains that the quality of code is low, too many bugs in each new release. How can you find the root cause? So we just discussed that it may happen, that they come to you and say every time you release and there are, there are bugs there. So, um, so probably the bugs are 
related to some functionality which you broke which before it worked now it didn't now it doesn't and then we fix it then we release again and it doesn't work again it happens quite a lot so these are the instruments of of a qa expert qa engineer these are not not the instruments of the tester the, the instruments of the tester are the uh, i don't know the intellij idea <laughs> maybe the uh some uh, jmeter software which will put the extra traffic on your on your web application uh maybe the what else is the the, the, the browser the, the internet browser is the instrument of a tester so the tester is working like a programmer mostly trying to break the the the, the product qa engineer is a completely different kind of person qa engineer doesn't need to be a programmer doesn't need to be a tester qa needs to understand how to find relationship between different metrics how to find correlation, how to find dependencies between, for example, the amount of people quit our team and the amount of bugs the customer reports to us. Is there a relation? And if the relation is there, then how can we fix that by, by, by improving which metric? So the job of a QA, quality assurance and quality control, remember there are two things actually, QA and QC, you need to understand the difference. So QA versus QC. QA is quality assurance, QC is quality control. So QA, the first one, is about um, de uh, deciding which metric we will, uh, we will collect and how we will, how uh, collecting certain metrics will help us to improve certain other metrics. So like I gave you an example, you go through the team, you, you, you look at everything, at all the processes, which, all the processes that, 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 that happened there, and you, and you think of what we can measure here. And then you build the spreadsheets, you put the numbers there, you decide how this will happen, what the metrics will, will, will come to one place, when, why, who will do it. That's QA. That's quality assurance. So you build like a map of metrics, like a map of of strings which go to different places in the entire process so you check the testers you check the programmers you check the, the the hr you check the customer support you check everybody and you put all everything into one big picture and this is called qa and then qc quality control and then you start controlling that and then you start taking the metric and saying okay now the metric is seven and this metric is five plus five now it's time to do something what what can you do you go to this department and say please pay attention to this metric it is too high they don't know why you're saying that they have no idea where you get this information you're coming out of the blue and telling them you are committing too frequently to the code base please slow down they just look at you and just say really why what's going on why do you want me to commit less and you just say you don't care i'm just telling you because i'm the qa expert i know because i see how it is connected to the quality of product or it is connected to how many people will lose every year and they will ask you like are you crazy but you don't answer that you just tell them i know this is the this is the information which i which i have as a project manager because i see the full picture and this is quality control when you go and tell what to do you make actions you you take actions in the qa you don't take actions you this is my understanding. Maybe I'm a little bit here uh, going off a little bit of the PM book, but this is my understanding. In quality assurance, you, uh, you think. You think and you design your quality assurance plan. In the QC, this is control. In the control, you actually do the actions. You, you act. You, you pull the strings. <laughs> in the QA, you, you design the strings. You put them. And then in QC, you pull the strings. So here, the right answer is this one five whys do you know what it is it's a technique which is quite helpful not only in the quality control but helpful in in requirements engineering and project management in life it's a technique which is called five whys because you ask the question why five times so basically imagine that the customer complains so that you have this information so they come to you and say you know our customer complains too much so what 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 should you do what can we do hey you project manager do something so you ask five times you ask the, the why question so you ask why customer complains so often and they will tell you because we release uh, many bugs second question why we release many bugs because we release frequently why we release frequently because the customer asked us to release frequently why the customer asked us to release frequently 
Because they change requirements very often. Why they change requirements very often? Because our requirements document is not established well. It was never discussed with the customer properly. Here is the root cause. So you found the root cause. You were going from the top problem down to lower, lower, lower level, asking the question, why, why, why? And usually five times is enough. So there's not a magic number five. You can, of course, ask six times, seven times, but you continue asking why. And usually, that's what the people say, that usually five times is enough. You will get to the root cause. You will understand, okay, here's the problem. And you're the QA expert. You need to do it to find out which metric is the, the troublemaker. So you start with the top metric, which says customer is not happy. You cannot do much with that. It's too high level. Then you go down and ask why, why, why. And then you will go down to the, to the number, to the metric, which stays on a very, very low level. And this metric will be, I don't know, because the air conditioner doesn't work or doesn't work well. And because the air conditioner doesn't work well, everything else goes up, up, up to the chain of the metrics because the air conditioner doesn't work well. The, the, the programmer, these five programmers sitting in this room, they're not happy. So they're making more bugs than usual. And then because of this, this, this and that, and then you go up and understand that this is why the customer is not happy. So your job as a QA, QA manager is to ask five times away. So what is this plan, do, check, act? Plan, do, check, act is the, the, the idea that uh, when you do uh, quality assurance and quality control, you do plan. So first of all, you, you put the strings, you plan to do it a certain way, then you do it. So you do some quality control. So you start pulling strings a little bit, then you check, okay, how did it work? And then you act. So you change something. So you decide, okay, maybe I did it wrong. Maybe I need to, to act to, to make some actions. If I understand it correctly, it's quite, quite vague term. So I give it to you to understand that people, many people are obsessed about this uh, uh, PDCA, uh, PDCA acronym in project management, but I'm not sure how far it is from a simple logic. So it's simply logical to plan, then do, then check what you did and then act according to what is the result. Six Sigma. Six Sigma is the um, the idea uh, came to us from Japan, where they, on some factories, I think it was Toyota, they suggested to, uh, to control, um, to control the quality so that, uh, the amount of defects, this is one of the metrics, the key metric in the quality control, one of the metrics, remember, not the only one, but one of the metric. And of course, one of the most important one is the amount of defective, uh, defective products, which you ship to the customer. So they suggested to, uh, to put it into, uh, a normal distribution, something like this. So let's say, uh, and then split it into, I believe there's, there's a Sigma, there's two Sigma, there is three Sigma, something like that. Again, one sigma, uh, two sigma, three sigma. So this is, uh, uh, again, don't take me as an expert here, but to my knowledge, your idea is to, if this is on this axis, if this is the number of defects, defects, then, uh, and this is the number of something, I don't know what goes horizontally, uh, so you should stay, the number of defects should stay somewhere here, which is somewhere, I think three, yeah, four, five. So it goes like this, 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 and here it's going to be six Sigma. So the amount of defects, uh, that you deliver should be within these, um, within these borders. Anyway, I, I'm, I'm just told you, I told you some something that I'm not really expert at. You can read about it. Six Sigma is that you deliver a predictable number of defective product, defective details. So you make, for example, some elements. So you, you manufacture certain elements and you make 1 million of them. So out of 1 million, you're, you're allowed to, and this Sigma, Sigma is coming from the normal distribution, uh, normal distribution formula. So they just, expecting you to deliver certain amount of defective elements. And that was quite a, uh, a discovery at that time, because at that time, as far as I understand, people didn't really, uh, didn't really 
we're not really ready to the idea that we are okay to deliver uh, broken products. They just thought that quality means everything is great. And then Six Sigma told them, no, no, not everything, but one out of a million, it's okay to have a broken product. It's okay to have not even one, but three out of a million. It's acceptable that these three cars, for example, or three uh, computers or three mobile phones are defective. And that's perfectly all right. If we do it, then we are uh, within the expected quality uh, limitations. And that was, a, at that time, a discovery. So they told us that uh, predicting the amount of bugs is okay, is, is, uh, is normal. And then fishbone analysis. Fishbone analysis is uh, somewhat close to five Ys. It's when you start with the, uh, start with the different uh, causes. So we have, for example, we have, uh, like I said, broken air conditioner. We have, uh, uh, I don't know, lazy programmer. We have uh, bad requirements. We had uh, CI is failing. We have something else. And they all go to some root cause. So we put them into this fishbone. Why fishbone? Because it looks like a fish. You see? So it looks, this diagram looks like a fish. And then in this cause could be other like this. So you put you put many causes into one picture and then you decide which of them is the primary effector of, of the entire situation. And then you eventually, you can come to the root cause. So all of this is the mechanisms for the QA expert, how to, uh, how to analyze the situation and to decide who is the troublemaker. You see, I'm not really, uh, I'm not, I'm not really, uh, uh, I'm really professional in this territory because I, I haven't done this uh, too much in my, in my life. So usually we don't do it like this formally. We don't do it in practical projects. We don't draw fishbone diagrams. We, we usually do five whys if we are, uh, that, that's, on, that's enough. So we don't go into really like this six sigma and whatever. This is for big projects. This is for projects with millions and millions of dollars of investment and where the project man management is really professional. I haven't had a chance to be a project manager in that kind of project. So usually I work in middle size, small size software projects where just five whys is enough. So just keep asking, keep asking and understand that QA is about finding out who is a troublemaker and trying to affect that particular territory trying to do quality control in this particular place. Not just going around the office and saying, ah, we don't deliver a good product. We're not a good team. Something is wrong. We need another team building. Instead, try to be more professional and find the root cause, like I told you. Collect all the metrics, put them into one large list, and then think, what do you see? Then first start collecting them. Start measuring everything you can measure, and then do it in two, three months. And then look at the graph and see, and see, okay, this is what's going on in our team. The number of defects goes up. The number of commits goes down. The number of people who quit our team goes up. The number of time people spend in the office goes down. So all of these numbers, and then you will see the dependencies. You will understand what's, what's going on. Question number seven. The biggest enemy of quality is who? What do you think? Biggest enemy of quality is what? In my opinion, it's this one. So let's discuss one by one. Yeah, Arsene is right. Number four. So let's discuss them one by one. Bureaucracy. Bureaucracy is definitely a friend of quality, not an enemy. What is bureaucracy? Bureaucracy means everything is on paper. Everything is written on paper. So everything that happens in our team can be traced on paper. Formalism. Yeah, Arsene is uh, making a good uh, correction. So formalism, bureaucracy, let's call it formalism. It doesn't matter. You just maybe it doesn't, you, maybe you don't like the word bureaucracy, but bureaucracy is not a bad word. Bureaucracy is bad when it's too much bureaucracy, when bureaucracy is, uh, is dominating all other areas. But when everything is written on paper, it's a friend of quality because, because you as a quality engineer can control everything. You can see everything. If, for example, people already 
write down all the bugs that they find in Jira and they track their office attendance in the system and they track the air conditioner problems in the system and they blah 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 everything everything is already in the in the spreadsheets it's perfect so it's a friend of bureaucracy of of, of uh, quality kind of quality bureaucracy is a it's good second bugs how can bugs be the enemy of the quality bugs are the ingredients of quality bugs is just one metric which we measure so bugs programmers air conditioning system uh, complaints the jira all of these elements are the ingredients of quality so we cannot say that bugs are the enemy if we would not have bugs we would not know what the quality is so it's like saying that uh, the blood pressure is the enemy of the surgeon no, the blood pressure is not the enemy of the surgeon. The surgeon cannot work without knowing what is the blood pressure. Of course, when the blood pressure of the patient goes up, then it's a problem for the doctor. Then, yeah, the doctor needs to do something with it. But if if the if we don't know what is the blood pressure, then it doesn't make any sense anymore. Negligence. Negligence is close. So now we need to decide which one of these two are the real troublemakers. So negligence means that we don't care. So we just pay, don't pay attention to, to what we do. We don't pay attention to, uh, to, to how good is, is our contribution, more or less. And this means enthusiasm. So we pay a lot of attention to what we do. So we, so we write good code. We try to create more unit tests. We try to create uh, better solutions all the time. We try to help the customer. We try blah, blah, blah. This is... The problem with this is that it's difficult to control. So when people are enthusiastic, they are doing it because they want it, not because you want it as a project manager, not because the project wants it, not because it's under control, but because they want it. It may look better for some of you at the first sight, but look closer. If people work out of their only internal intrinsic motivation, it means that you as a project manager have no control over what's going on. If you are a project manager who doesn't want to have control, maybe it's good. If you are the leader, the mentor, the motivator, then yes, you just let people do what, you, what they want and they will do because they're good people. But in reality, you rarely deal with all the good people in the team. Usually the team consists of good people and lazy people and very often the amount of lazy people is bigger than the amount of good people i mean people who are enthusiastic and these enthusiastic people they will do a lot of work enthusiastically because they they love to work and other people will just do nothing and you have no control over that so because you don't control the people the lazy people you don't control and you don't control the enthusiastic people you control nobody you just let things happen eventually the enthusiastic people will realize that they are the ones who are underappreciated. They do a lot of work and they get almost the same money and these, as these lazy people. Because usually people get the same salaries no matter how enthusiastic or lazy they are. So you're going to lose these enthusiastic people. They're going to quit. That's inevitable. It happens in most teams. The people who are the top contributors, they eventually quit. They get frustrated. They get unhappy if there is no control over them if they really work out of enthusiasm. But if you control everybody, if you, if they work, if there's, if there's negligence there and you fight with the negligence, if you fight with lazy people, then this gives you control over the situation. And in this case, enthusiastic people will see that you are in charge, that you are, as a project manager, you care about what's going on. You can control lazy people as well. So you can do something with them. You can, you can, you look at what they do. You control their code. You control their, 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 their contributions. So you, you, you constantly enforce certain quality control mechanisms there. So you install some metrics, you install some, uh, some, some make some instruments, which will protect the code base and protect the project against negligence. If you don't install those mechanisms and you rely on enthusiasm of people, eventually you lose these people and the project collapse. So negligence is, is actually a friend, a friend of, 
I won't do this thing. Negligence is a friend, and enthusiasm is an enemy. It may sound counterintuitive, but trust me, it is. This is my experience of many, many years of management telling me this. When you expect people to be, to be enthusiastic, if you love enthusiastic people, you're eventually going to ruin your project. So expect people to be negligent, and if they exist in your team, it's great. So say thank you to them. If they exist, it means you will constantly worry about quality control. You will constantly worry about punishing them for negligence. And if you worry about that, you will install the mechanisms of punishment. And these mechanisms of punishment will, will control everything, will help the enthusiastic people as well, and you will be, uh, and you will be uh, moving up. The question is, you will be in the constant stress. As a project manager, stress is the part of your job description. Of course, you will be in the you will be in the constant stress. Of course, you will be constantly thinking of how to control what's going on, how to do quality control. But that's your job. That's that's what you do. Okay, final question. We have just a few minutes. There are four bugs reported. Which one of them you would prioritize as more important than others? Important. Remember the importance. So this is a simple question. There are uh, there is there are things which are important and they're urgent. So in every bug report, you have urgency and importance. So something which is important means that it's the, the impact of this bug is huge, but maybe we can not necessarily need to fix it today. And urgent means that maybe impact is not big, but we need to make it urgently. So the right answer here is this. So this is the most important. If you have a flow missed in the use case, it means that the entire team is implementing some functionality which is probably not needed. So we are wasting tons of money, tons of time on doing something which is wasted. So this is the bug related to the bug related to requirements. And, um, you know, there's a very famous uh, diagram where people say that uh, the bug, uh, how to say something like that. So these are, this is the cost of bug related to code. This is the cost of bug related to design design code this is the cost of bug related to architecture and this is the cost of bug related to requirements and one million dollars so the bug which is made which we made in the requirements document is extremely expensive because it affects uh, all other activities but the bug which we made in the coding area it's easy. We just fix it, but we know that we're doing the right thing. We're going the right track. So we just fix it and move on. So that's the cheapest bug, the cheapest bug. But of course, the urgency, the urgency is, of course, here. So this is the most urgent bug. We need to fix it immediately now because it's a loophole, security loophole. So we don't wait. So when we report the bug, usually in JIRA and all other re bug reporting systems, there are two important parameters, the importance and the urgency. So you need to understand the difference. Importance means the value and urgency means the criticalities, like when it needs to be fixed. Okay. Uh, one more question from you guys. Is there a trade-off between preferring enthusiastic people over negligent? Also, does it mean that negligent people should be generally more preferable? I see that this question touched the nerve, huh? Uh, there's a, you're, you're discussing without me. So negligence should never be preferable. Well, you need to, if, if you have only enthusiastic people in your team, you're in a huge trouble. I'm telling you, you are losing your control. You're losing your power as a project manager. You're losing your skills. You're losing everything. So you are going to be eventually moved out of the picture. You will be just an observer of the results. Maybe the project will be completed successfully. Maybe if you're lucky, but we're not talking about luck in this course. We're talking about getting control. We're talking about staying in charge of things. And if you want to be in charge, if you want to be predictable project manager, if you want to really predict the future and then this future happens according to your prediction, then you should expect negligence. You should welcome negligence. You should say, hey, sure, of course, come to my team, you lazy programmer. Come to me and work with me and see what happens. 
I will deal with you. I know how to fight with you. I have this unit testing control system. I have this continuous integration setup. I have this QA system which goes around and checks everybody. You will be under strict control. We're going to turn you from a lazy programmer to a very effective programmer. That's how powerful we, powerful we are. But if you just say, hey, I'm only looking for enthusiastic programmers. Come to me because I'm a completely weak completely powerless project manager. I, I don't know what to do with lazy people. I only know what to do with enthusiastic people, but there is nothing to do with them. They work by themselves. You don't need to control them. You, your role is not needed there if you, are, if you have only enthusiastic people, but this happens extremely rarely in my experience of 30 years of working with uh, software teams. Usually teams consist of 20% enthusiasts, which do 80% of the work and 80% of lazy people, which do 20% of the work. So your question is what to do with these 80% of the people so that you don't lose these 20%. So negligence is your friend. I actually wrote about this, the whole chapter in the Code Ahead book. So you got the idea. Okay, homework for you. I suggest that you try to create quality management plan for your some small pet project. Again, make it one page. Define on one page which metrics you would collect. Define in this, imagine that you're starting the project and say to the team, which elements, where are you going to track? Where are you going to get the information? What information are you going to collect and put together in order to control the quality? Just write it down. Quality management plan. This is a document which explains everything I told you on this lecture. 